uh, living God, send us now the help of your Holy Spirit to enable each one of us to receive the word which you speak to us in Jesus our Lord. Amen. So this is a story featuring an unusually large cast of characters. Most uh, narratives in the Old Testament are minimalist. They involve just two or three actors. But in this story, we meet more than 10 people. There are more than five Arameans. That's the king, uh, Naaman himself, his wife, and his whole company, as it's described in verse 15, which uh, verse 23 makes clear comprised more than two servants. And there are five Israelites, the servant girl, the king, Elisha the prophet, his servant Gehazi, and the unnamed messenger uh, in verse 10. So it's a large cast, but also quite a balanced cast, with as many outsiders to Israel's faith as insiders. And throughout the story, there's a recurring play on the vocabulary of servanthood. Everyone in the story is either a master mistress or a servant, or indeed like uh, Naaman himself both. And the story invites the question, uh, what does true service look like? Uh, and with one lamentable exception, servants come out of the story rather better than masters, uh, the powerless rather better than those with power, and the less privileged better than those with more privilege. So the potential for racism, both of the individual human heart and of the kind embedded in institutional structures is present throughout the story and breaks the surface of the text at least twice in my view. In the exposition that follows, my debt to other interpreters will be obvious, uh, to Jacques Ellul, the French Bartian philosophical theologian, whose book, The Politics of God and the Politics of Man, is one of those formative texts every serious student of the Bible should read, uh, but also predictably to some of the best recent uh, commentators on this text, to Brueggemann, Fretheim, Wallace and Hobbes, uh, and I also retain a soft spot for the more folksy devotional commentary uh, by Dale Ralph Davis. But I don't follow any of those uh, commentators entirely and the exposition I'm about to offer uh, is my own. And you'll see from the handout that I'm going to try to convey the meaning of this narrative by dividing it into five parts, each featuring a contrast between two key characters. So I'll turn first of all to verses one to four to contrast Naaman with his servant girl, then to verses five to seven to contrast the two kings of Israel and Aram or Syria. Thirdly, to verses 8 to 14, to contrast Naaman and Elisha before the healing, and then to verses 15 to 19, to contrast the two of them after the healing, and finally, uh, to verses 20 to 27, to contrast Naaman with Gehazi, uh, the servant of Elisha. So Naaman features in all but one of these five dramatic acts, and he's depicted mostly as an example of faith and trust, humility and integrity, an example for us to follow, but at the midpoint, he is exposed briefly as petty and self-serving, a man whose attitudes have been formed far more than he is aware by the privilege he enjoys at home uh, where he belongs. First of all, then, verses one to four, Naaman and the servant girl, or rather, since she's a captive with no choice in her situation, the slave girl. The story is set at a time when Israel and Syria were at odds with one another, not that that precises it, uh, dates it very precisely, of course, uh, but this was a period in which Syria had the upper hand. So here's how Naaman is introduced to us. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory, uh, you could equally translate that, salvation to Syria. He was a mighty warrior, but he was a leper. And I suspect when we hear that phrase, but he was a leper, we're inclined to think, oh, poor man. Uh, but that view would not have had much currency in Israel at that time. Then and there, Naaman would have been regarded as an evil man and his leprosy joyfully acclaimed as a mark of God's judgment upon him. As far as Israel was concerned, it would have been easy to despise Naaman three times over as a Syrian, uh, as a man of blood who had led armies into battle against the people of God and as a leper. He's not introduced to us as a poor man, uh, but as a villain. Yet paradoxically also, as a man through whom the Lord, Yahweh, Israel's God, has been at work. By him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. I think it's that detail uh, which enables the reader to be disposed with sympathy uh, towards Naaman, despite his CV. The second verse introduces the slave girl. Now, on one of their raids, the Syrians had carried off a little girl from Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Uh, the maid is a member of the people of God, but only just. She's not yet a woman, but a girl, not just a girl, but a slave girl, not just a slave girl, but a captive. 
And the contrast here is complete. Two Hebrew adjectives polarize the two characters. We're told in verse one that Naaman is gadol, great. And we're told in verse two that the servant girl is katan, small. So just take in the extent of the contrast. Aramean against Israelite, native against exile, conqueror against captive, male against female, adult against child, right-hand man to a king against slave girl to a mistress, celebrity against anonymity. Yet this girl cares for her master. Oh, she says to his wife, I wish my Lord could visit the prophet in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. I'm reading between the lines here, I admit, but the girl's suggestion implies something about her faith. It tells us at least that she had heard of Elisha and had confidence in him, but I think it implies that she'd managed to sustain her faith even in her captivity. I think it indicates an extraordinary generosity of spirit. She has come to care for her master despite her circumstances and believes that the Lord, the God of Israel, might care for this Syrian too. In her powerlessness, she manifests no racism. Before we move on from the first section, just notice how Naaman's wife is glossed over. Um, it was to her that the slave girl that spoke, so presumably her message was relayed to Naaman by his wife. But the story skips over the bit where his wife surely spoke to her husband and simply tells us that Naaman went to report to the king what he'd been told by the girl. When we read scripture, it's good to be alert to what happens between the lines. In this case, between verses three and four, the wife has fallen into the gap. And the little girl whose intervention is decisive drops out of the story at the end of verse three, never to be mentioned at all again. And it's true that the text is not explicit, but I assume it is partly on account of the patriarchy of Naaman and the king and on account of their racism that the girl is marginalized so completely and so quickly. A little foreign slave girl is of no account to them. The storyline follows the lines of power. That's part one. The second scene is the only one in which Naaman does not feature. This is verses five to seven. And the contrast is between the two kings, the king of Aram and the king of Israel. And it's, it's almost comical to see how they mismanage the situation. Maybe we expect the pagan king to resort to power games and provocation. He has a touch of Putin about him. But we might hope for more, for more faith, more godly trust from the king of Israel. It's a disappointment to the reader that he interprets the situation as a pretext for war on the part of his opposite number. Neither king has any time for prayer. It's all real politique with them to coin a phrase, they don't do God. At any rate, Naaman reports the proposal of his slave girl to the king. The king gives him sick leave. So off he goes, taking with him a predictably extravagant supply of potential gifts and a letter of introduction to the king of Israel, which reads, Dear Ahab, at least I think it was most likely Ahab, it might have been Joram. When you get this letter, you will know that I have sent you my servant Naaman. Please cure him of his leprosy. Yours sincerely, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. It's the sort of letter Ahab and his contemporaries would have expected from the Aramean king. He's a tyrant and he behaves as we expect a tyrant to do. He treats the matter as if it were purely political without any recognition of a religious dimension. He addresses his letter to Israel's king, on the assumption that in Israel, as in Aram, the prophet is at the king's beck and call. In fact, despite the slave girl's explicit counsel, he makes no mention of the prophet at all. If the gap between verses three and four presented the first airbrushing in our story, perhaps the gap between verses three and six represents the second. First, Naaman's wife and the slave girl are glossed over, and now the prophet is too. The only Israelite the king of Aram perceives as being in any way significant is his own opposite number. It's a status thing. The king of Aram is used to getting what he wants and he deals with Naaman's difficulty as if it could be resolved by political means. If the accompanying gifts are sufficiently lavish, then an official letter bearing his diplomatic seal will surely secure his objective. He does not discern the hand of God at work. And in terms of the biblical narrative, that is exactly what we would expect of the Syrian king. Unfortunately, the king of Israel fares no better at first he seems to, but then he too reverts to political manoeuvring. His initial reaction is worthy of the Lord's anointed. He knows that a leper's healing is a religious issue, not a political one. Am I God, he says, to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But just when you hope that in his predicament he will turn to God, or at least to God's prophet, he turns instead to his political and military advisors. Foul, he cries. It's an act of provocation, 
the king of Syria is trying to pick a fight with me. It doesn't seem to occur to him to ask the prophet for help. Like the king of Aram, he too seems ready to airbrush Elisha out of the story. It's good to be reminded now and then of the ultimate powerlessness of power playing politicians, whether they happen to be the PM of the UK or the president of Russia. Now as then, politicians are particularly prone to act either out of a mistaken sense of their own power on the one hand, like the king of Syria, or out of a short-sighted sense of fear on the other, like the king of Israel. And here both the misplaced self-confidence of the former and the groundless panic of the latter are held up for our ridicule. And whether locally or internationally, it seems to me the church should always be ready as scripture is here to lampoon political figures who act without reference to God, who can see no further than their own status, their own might, their own advantage and privilege, and who have no sense at all of their accountability. Thirdly, we come to verses eight to 14 and to the contrast between Elisha and Naaman before the healing. Following on from the one in verses five to seven, this is basically a second arm wrestle between two alpha males, only this time both expect the other to acknowledge their superior superiority. And here is the first place where race is explicitly at play. Elisha and Naaman are both undeniably powerful men. The former is a successful prophet, the latter a successful soldier, but they are both flawed too. Both the miracle working man of God and the sword wielding man of blood are full of their own self-importance. Did you notice how the very first thing we learn about Elisha strikes a discordant note? When he hears that the king of Israel has ripped his robes in panic, he sends him a message. Why tear your clothes? Don't be so defeatist. Didn't it occur to you to send the man to me? So far, so good. Let him come to me now so that he may know what? That there is a God in Israel, surely. But that's not what he says. Let him come to me now so that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. His own status is clearly of primary importance to Elisha. His nation matters to him too, a prophet in Israel, he says. Of course, there are times when ministers have to assert the dignity of their calling, when we rightly want to say, with the emphasis on the first half of the sentence, I am a minister of the living God. Like when someone else parks their car in the space reserved for the bishop. Or you're at the front of a shopping queue dressed in your dog collar and you have your credit card rejected. But it's usually a mistake for us to emphasize ourselves in that way. And there is at least one clue in our passage to suggest that Elisha was mistaken in this case because after he has been healed and converted, what does Naaman say? Behold, now I know that there is a prophet in Israel. No, gloriously in verse 15, he says, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. It is very easy for us when we're about the Lord's business to speak and act out of a concern more for our own glory than God's, either because we feel as Elisha perhaps felt that we have been overlooked or because we feel we're being played in some way. That's when we hear a little voice inside us saying, don't mess with me, I am a minister of the living God. And ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ have a very special responsibility to beware of the difference between identifying and aligning ourselves with the coming of God's kingdom, which is always good, and identifying and aligning the coming of God's kingdom with ourselves, which is not. But Naaman is no less proud and no less posturing. The passage tells us that he came with his horses and chariots and halted at the door of Elisha's house. It's clear, isn't it, that those horses and chariots are status symbols for Naaman, that it's an entourage designed to him press. He's treating the situation like a state visit. I'm an important man, these treppings say, and I expect to be treated like one. And when Elisha doesn't even come out of his house to greet the visitor personally, but just sends a messenger to him saying, go wash in a river, he receives it justifiably as a deliberate snub. Naaman takes offense. Just a minute, he says, I'm not going to get fobbed off with some lackey or gopher. I want to see the prophet in person. He could at least come out and perform some dramatic religious ritual for a man of my position. And then he betrays his racism. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Gosh, one river better than another. That's hardcore institutional racism. Naaman speaks as someone formed in privilege 
to assume superiority. And once again, after the slave girl in scene one, here in scene three, it's the servants who save the day. It's only their intervention which prevents Naaman from stomping off in a huff. They tell him, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, and in Hebrew, that's literally something great, something gadol, something commensurate with Naaman's own status, in other words, would you not have done it? So what do you have to lose when he's asked you to do something sinful? To this point in the story, it's the servants who set the gold standard of reason and even of faith. It's the powerless, the less privileged, who appear unblighted by racism. And when Naaman does go through with what the man of God has instructed, he is healed. He went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan in accordance with the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And when it says his skin was like that of a little child, the Hebrew is katon, and reminds us again of that katan little girl back in Syria, faithfully serving her Lord, but easily forgotten by the reader, if not by God. The next scene in verses 15 to 19a is the theological highlight of the whole story. By the grace of God, his healing brings not only Naaman, but also Elisha to their senses and lifts them up out of their previously narrow and sectarian interests to stand shoulder to shoulder before their common God. In fact, it's Naaman who is centre stage here. He alone of the two is named in verse 17. And although both men speak twice in this section, in the NRSV, the total word length of Elisha's speeches is 14 words, whereas Naaman's is 106 words. And whereas Elisha refers to the Lord just once in verse 16, Naaman the Syrian refers to the Lord three times in verses 17 to 18. I see evidence of a proper conversion in Naaman here. Until this point, we have a clear impression of a man full of his own self-importance, concerned with his status, insisting on due recognition. In that context, his words in verses 15 to 18 are startling. Five times he refers to himself as a servant, when, as I say, it's servants who have set the standard in this narrative to date. There is a humility here now which wasn't much in evidence before, and which I take to be the work of God's Spirit. And three times, as I say, he names the Lord, Yahweh, First, there's pretty much a confession of faith in verse 15. Now I know, he says, that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. No God in all the earth but the Lord. Naaman acknowledges in the God of Israel one universal Lord, Lord of Syria and of all the earth. And like everyone who has genuinely experienced the grace of God, Naaman wants to express his gratitude. Please accept a present from your servant, he tells Elijah. Now, don't forget that Naaman has come to Israel with a pretty full kitty. Verse 5 has told us he's got 10, 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. So Naaman is not short of a bob or two, and he wants to give to express his thanks. But Elisha has also been refined and reformed in this encounter, and he knows that to accept a gift from Naaman would be to accept or to appear to accept some credit for his healing. As the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing, he says. After all that point scoring and posturing in the earlier scene, Isaiah, uh, Elisha too is now ready to identify himself as an undeserving servant. And then in verses 17 to 19 comes one of the most beautiful speeches in all scripture, as Naaman takes his first tentative steps in discipleship. He's rumbled that if he is to be an authentic servant of the living God, it will impact on his lifestyle. Denied the opportunity to pay the prophet, Naaman says, well, at least let me have two donkey loads of earth, for from now on, I won't offer any sacrifice to any god but the Lord. This is really very encouraging. Here is a new convert struggling to overcome the strictly territorial view of God with which he's grown up. On the one hand, he now knows that the God of Israel is the God of the whole world. But on the other hand, he still thinks that the God of Israel can only be worshipped truly on Israelite soil. So he wants to take some of that soil home. If you'll forgive a, a horrible pun, uh, he's preparing the ground for a lifetime of worship. But at this point, it gets more complicated because Naaman asks forgiveness for a sin he has not yet committed. In this matter, he says, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow down in the house of Rimmon, may the Lord pardon me. He now recognizes that Rimmon is not a god. And therefore, that to bow to him is wrong and idolatrous, but he anticipates doing it anyway. What kind of repentance is that? 
most clergy I know would, to say the least, raise an eyebrow if they were asked to grant pardon for sin in advance. But Elisha says, go in peace. He doesn't give Naaman a lecture urging him to boycott the temple of Rimon, or, or better still, to abandon the king of Syria and defect to Israel. Nor does he deny that there is an issue of conscience here by saying, you don't need to ask pardon for that. There's nothing wrong with bowing down in pagan temples if you're worshipping the living God in your heart. It seems to me that Elisha's response is a recognition that Naaman's dilemma is real. The new convert is not asking for indulgence. He wants to find a way out. He just can't see one. It would be worrying if Naaman was trying to excuse himself, but he's not. He's accusing himself. These are the words of a man whose conscience is becoming keener, not duller. And what's more, this kind of dilemma is, I think, an inevitable part of living out your faith in the world. It's something you'll seldom experience if you're constantly and exclusively surrounded by those who worship the true God. But Naaman is called to serve God in Syria, not in Israel. And his dilemma is common to all who are called to serve God in the thick of the world, all who dare following Jesus to receive sinners and to eat with them, all who seek to shine as lights for Christ in the world to the glory of God the Father. It's a dilemma familiar to any Christian who is truly committed to his or her neighbours, to any Christian fully engaged in local or national politics, to any Christian doctor or teacher, to any church fully engaged in the life of its local community. Only those who are entirely separate from the world will escape pinch points like Naaman's. And to those who seek in all faithfulness to serve the Lord, the God of Israel, as it were in Syria, the scriptures say, go in peace. And that brings us finally to verses 19b to 27 and to the contrast between Gehazi and Naaman. Gehazi is the only servant in this story not to come out of it well. And it's in this fifth and final act that Naaman, the subject of racist attitudes in Act 3, is the object of them. It turns out that it is really Gehazi who is guilty of idolatry, not Naaman. And there's a sense in which in this final scene, Naaman becomes, as it were, a model Israelite, and Gehazi becomes, as it were, a godless pagan. So just as the leper is cleansed, the previously clean Gehazi becomes leprous. The sin in Gehazi's heart is evident in verse 20. My master, he says, has let that Aramean Naaman off too lightly. It's a racist slur, that Aramean. Unlike Elisha, Gehazi has not been able to shake off his nationalism. He can't bear to see the riches of God so freely poured out on a foreigner, an outsider, an enemy. It's not just that Gehazi defines and diminishes Naaman with reference to his race. In addition, the word that, as in that Aramean, is as insulting in the Hebrew as it sounds in English. And when he says, as the Lord lives, in verse 20, he is, of course, picking up on Elisha's oath uttered in verse 16. But where Elisha said, as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing, Gehazi's words are, as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something. Elisha is determined to accept nothing. Gehazi is determined to get something. Naaman, on the other hand, is still manifesting all the gratitude and generosity, which are the hallmarks of a genuine experience of God's grace. While Gehazi is thinking of no one but himself, Naaman is concerned with the well-being of everyone but himself. Is everything shalom? He asks. Is everyone okay? And then Gehazi lies about his errand and asks Naaman for a talent of silver and two changes of clothing, to which Naaman replies, by all means, but take two talents. And he gifts wraps them and sends Gehazi on his way with an escort. And when at the end of verse 23, we're told that two of Naaman's servants carried the gift bags in front of Gehazi, that's a bit of a giveaway. The same Hebrew phrase, not always translated consistently into English, has come up four times already in this story. It's there in the very first verse when we're told that Naaman was in favour before his master. And in verse two, where we're told the slave girl served before Naaman's wife. It's there in verse 15 when Naaman stood before Elisha. And it's there in verse 16 when Elisha refers to the Lord before whom I serve. To go before someone in this story means to serve them. So contrast Naaman, who started the story so full of his own self-importance, but who is humble enough now to jump down from his chariot to meet Gehazi in verse 21. Contrast him with Gehazi in verse 23, who thinks only of his own interests and apparently feels nothing amiss, nothing discordant in processing back to the citadel with two servants before him. Naaman is becoming more of a servant as the story unfolds, 
Gehazi tragically less so. Gehazi has fallen into the great trap of idolatry, which is to suppose that our possessions, our roles and our achievements constitute our identity, our greatness, rather than the blessings we receive freely at God's hand. And whether idolatry is the platform for racism or racism the platform for idolatry is a moot point. Horribly often, they go hand in hand. Then comes the denouement in verses 25 and 26. Gehazi is now back where he belongs. He is before his master. It's the fifth and final occurrence of that phrase in this chapter. Elisha's question offers Gehazi one last chance of penitence. Where have you been? Gehazi doubles down on his deceit, apparently unaware, despite his experience of God's power and grace at work through Elisha historically, that his master might already know the answer to his own question. Your servant has not gone anywhere at all, he says. But the prophet has seen the whole episode in the eye of the spirit and has discerned Gehazi's greed and calls down the judgment of God upon him. What is Gehazi's sin? Elisha homes in on this. Is it a time, he asks, to accept money and to accept clothing, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female slaves? He's exaggerating what Gehazi's done, but perhaps not what Gehazi was dreaming of. Is this a time for profiting personally from the free gift of God poured out on another, he asks. Is there ever a time to profit personally from the free gift of God poured out on others? What can it possibly do except obscure grace by implying that the blessing of God can be bought or earned? This is the tragedy of the story. That little slave girl in exile had more insight into the nature of God's grace than the right-hand man of God's own prophet. This is something to take to heart. Whatever our newspapers and television screens may tell us, not least in the past week, the course of human history is not in the end determined by kings or generals or even acknowledged religious leaders, not in the Ukraine, not in Yemen. It is the grace of God which shapes human history, the grace of a God who consistently chooses the weak to shame the strong. And the same is true in church history. Church history books don't tell the whole story. It's more than likely that we just don't know the names of our greatest saints. This is a message we particularly need to hear in our inner cities and outer estates, where so much of people's experience inside and outside of the church tells them that power is exercised elsewhere by MPs in the commons or bankers in the city, by bishops in distant houses or preachers in packed suburban churches. But the truth, according to the scriptures, is that as often as not, among God's people as well as outside them, the grace of God is at work despite the famous and the powerful, rather than because of them. Our God still chooses the weak to shame the strong, the foolish to shame the wise, and anonymous slave girls to shame political, military, and religious leaders. And meanwhile, here is this sustained narrative, which explores race and status, exile and belonging, idolatry and the true worship of God, and which warns those who hold power that if they are to experience the grace of God, which Elisha and Naaman do in the end, it is always necessary first to check your privilege. Thank you.